In this tutorial, we are going to look at the entirely remade animation editor in Godot 3.1. We're going to look at the very basics here. We're going to look at the new interface. And in the next few videos, we will look at more specific features. To get started, we have a scene here with two position 2D nodes and they each contain a sprite. And that's the first thing I want to mention about animation. You can animate any node and any property you can find in the inspector. The colors, the scale, the vectors, the textures, etc. with Godot's animation editor. Now I recommend that you use some kind of node that acts as a pivot so that you can animate it and then you could change the scale of the sprite itself, for example, without losing the animation. We'll see that in a second. Each of these nodes can have their own animation player. The animation player is a node and as such you can add it to any scene, any branch of your tree, character, etc. We're going to add one to the circle and the square. So look for animation player. I'm going to duplicate it instantly and put it under the square here. Once you select an animation player, the animation interface pops up at the bottom of the screen. Allow me to move the keys here. I'm going to move them around there. From there, you can create new animations by clicking on the animation menu and going to new. And we're going to start with an animation called setup. I tend to create an animation called setup that contains the zeroed out base position of my animated scene, the square in this case. So there we will store this kind of rest pose for the sprite. Once you have an animation, you can open it in the inspector to edit its base properties. For that, you go to animation and open an inspector. In the inspector on the right, you will then see a few properties that you can change. You have the animation length or its duration. We're going to set it to zero for the setup one. You can set it to loop so that it keeps playing continuously. And you then have the step, the snapping intervals in the timeline. We can set it. In general, I will set it to 0.03, which corresponds to roughly 30 frames per second. 0.33 would be more precise, but we are limited. We just have two decimal places for this value. Notice that the values updated here, this is the animation length. Here we have the snapping value, the step, and the looping is right there. It's this little loop icon. So you don't have to open the animation in the inspector, you can use both buttons. You can toggle snapping on and off by clicking the snap text at the bottom of the panel. You can zoom in and out using the slider next to the zoom icon. And there is also one button that we're going to click. That's part of our animation player setup. Once you click it, the animation player will automatically play this animation by default at the start of the game. That's why that setup animation is important. We're going to use it to reset anything, a character, in this case our square, to reset a number of tracks or values, properties that we are going to animate. That said, let's get started animating our square. Although you can use the Add Track menu to add individual tracks, and from there, you could, for example, add a property track. So property is anything, for instance, on our square, the position, rotation, the scale, the modulate color, etc. These are individual properties. So if you add a property track, you can select the node you want to animate first, the square in our case, and from there, you can search for a given property. For example, position is inherited from the Node2D class, while the modulate color comes from canvas item. It's really nice as it ties back with the code as these are the same properties that you would access from GDScript or C Sharp, for example. 
you don't have to add these tracks. You also have these key icons that you can click in the inspector on the selected node. So you have them for each animatable property. Anytime you could click on the key here next to position and Godot will ask you if you want to create a new track for the position property. You can create it to insert a new track. At the top of the viewport in the toolbar, you will find some shortcuts for some very common properties, location, rotation, and scale. And you have a key icon you can use to key these specific properties on the selected nodes. We're going to animate the location, rotation, and scale. And we're going to do that with the square. So you can click on the little key here and Godot will offer you to create new tracks for all three properties and insert the keys. Let's create these. You can see it actually created only two new tracks and you now have some icons, the little diamond shapes that indicate animation keys. Let me explain how these work. If I move the square, rotate it, and I don't create a key, if I don't click the key icon, when I move on the animation tracks, you will see this square reset to the position, rotation, and scale stored in the key. I'm also going to add another value that we don't have at the top here. I'll select the square and key the modulate color. It's going to create a new property track. You can see here that the modulate track has a little square that represents the color of the node at this point. Okay, so that's for the base setup. Next up, when you click one of the keys in the animation editor, it opens in the inspector. There, you can change its time, its value, but also the easing. When it comes to the value, the most important ones are all the vectors, the more complex values, all the colors, where you will get a color picker. So you can animate color transitions. Note one thing, it's that when you change the key, it does change in the animation player, but you have to play the animation. So you have to click on the timeline or to press Shift D to play the animation to see the viewport update and your node update in the viewport. Let's talk a little more about the interface before we move forward. You have the ability to get onion skins. We'll see that a little later. They give you a preview of previous and next keyframes of how the animation evolves in place. And then you have this pin icon that I wanted to mention, which allows you to keep this animation editor open for a given animation player node. So when you click it, you will see in the scene tree here that this animation player is pinned. Even if I select another one, I don't get any change in the interface. I can go select any node, do whatever I want, and the animation player will stay there. When you are working on a complex animation that you need to test in game, etc., this is really handy as you can keep working without losing the bottom panel. From there, we are going to animate the square here. I'm going to center the view on it with the F key. And let's create some bounce animation, some kind of jump animation inspired by what you'd see in Thomas Was Alone, for example. So let's go to the animation menu and we are going to duplicate our setup animation. This will create a copy of it that we can then rename by going to the animation menu again going to the rename option. This one, let's call it jump. So there we start with the keys that we had on the previous animation. We are going to change the animation's length. So for that, you can use the slot in the right of the panel. We're going to change it to one second, for example, to start with. Then you can click and drag on the timeline to change the position of the time cursor and when you insert new keys they will insert at that time position. The line between two keys indicates that there is no change in the animation between 
these two keyframes in that time frame. If you move the character, for example, I can rotate and scale it. If I click the key, then you will see that there is no line on any of the tracks, meaning that there is a difference in the values between the keyframes there. I'm going to zoom in on the animation a little bit. And if you drag from the first keyframe to the second one, Godot will tween the positions. It will interpolate between the first and the second value. Now the way it interpolates is linear by default, so it's going to take an average over time, which tends to give you mushy animations. These animation lack punch by default. So you can select a given keyframe and in the inspector you will see an easing property. This one controls the transition between this keyframe and the next. If you pull the curve to the left, you click and drag to do so, the animation will start really quickly and slow down as it reaches the second keyframe. I'm going to modify the easing on all three of my keyframes, like so. And if I press Shift D to play the animation, you can see that now it starts a lot faster and it slows down as it reaches the second keyframe. Anytime you can click and drag to select keyframes or click, shift click to add keyframes to your selection and then click and drag the keyframes themselves to move them in time, making the animation slower in this case. Now a few shortcuts that you want to know regarding playback. Shift D to play the animation from the start, D to play forward, so I'm going to stop D to play forward, S to stop, and A to play backwards. And Shift A to play the animation backwards from the end. When you have an animation that you want to rewind in the gameplay, for example, you can test it with Shift A, like so. And D, A to play forward and backward. You can animate colors as well. We're going to see, by the way, how to duplicate keys. So once you have a keyframe selected, you can right click to duplicate it or press Ctrl D. It's going to create a copy of it. In Godot 3.1, you have much better visualization of various key types. For the color modulation, here you can see a gradient that shows the transition from orange to yellow. Note that I'm using a color modulation here over a sprite that is already yellow. So it's multiplying the sprite's color, which is quite nice as you can use it this way. I can start with a bright red color and go back to white to a neutral modulate color to m show the character taking damage or heating up something along those lines. But with that, we're going to remove the modulate track. When you have a track selected, you can see that with the double blue lines around it. You can delete a track anytime by clicking the dustbin icon to the right of it. Click that. Then we have some options as to how the track operates. The first one gives you control over how Godot interpolates between the keys. You have the ability to have a continuous interpolation, that's a continuous animation with averages from one key to the next. Then you can have discrete animation. So when you arrive on the second key and only then will the position change. This is useful if you want a really choppy or frame by frame animation, a more traditional look, especially when you are creating cutout characters. The trigger mode is here for properties that work as triggers, boolean values, switches, or sound play animation tracks. So these will automatically be set on trigger as you add these types of tracks. Capture is here for simple procedural animation. Godot will capture the value of the object before the start of the animation in the game, so something that you might change from the code, and it will linearly interpolate to the first key in the animation. So the way you use capture in general is you leave some time 
that is going to serve as a transition at the start of the animation and the object will then animate to the position that I have set on the first keyframe at 0 2 seconds and it will animate from the position of the square in game. So if I were to move it even without a key we can't see that in the animation player but it would smoothly animate from a given position to the position of the keyframe. Okay we're going to forget about capture mode. It's just some explanation of the modes. The next drop down allows you to override the default interpolation between the keyframes. Nearest is something that you often use. It's similar to discrete mode in the way it's going to render your animation. It's common to use when you are first creating the animation to make sure that your animation poses, the key poses work really well and you later can change it to linear. Although in game animation, I'm not sure that's super useful. Cubic is going to give you smoother transitions between the keyframes by default, but I would say that if you want good looking animation, you can leave it to linear by default and change the easings by hand or use the new Bezier curve tracks that we will we'll look at in another video. The last thing I'll mention for now is that you can select any number of keys and press the delete key to delete them. Or you can right click on them and select the delete keys option in the menu. I needed a slightly more complex animation to show you some more improvements. This is from Flossignu, our project with Purism sponsored by them. Note here, I have quite a few sprites that make up that character and its animation. So one of the nice improvements is now you will have a separation between the various nodes that you are animating. If you are using a skeleton 2D, you will see a list of the bones under the skeleton 2D itself. You have a button at the bottom of the interface here that you can use to toggle between the list view and the new organized view, the tree view. You can toggle it on or off anytime to have a more compact view of your animation tracks. Right next to it, you have a filter icon. If I click on it, all the animation tracks will disappear. This filters down to the nodes that you select in the node tree. If you select only one, you will only see the animation for this node. If you select multiple of them, you will see the animation tracks for all of them. Really nice when you want, for example, to focus only on the character's feet. I'll deactivate the filtering. And the last thing I want to show is how when I select a given node in the animation tree, you can see how I get a blue outline overlay on the node in the animation editor. It works for all selected nodes. So if I was to select the head and the body, for example, you can see that now I have the blue outlines for all of the three selected nodes in the anim tree. To wrap this up, let's talk about onion skinning. You have an onion-like icon that you can click to configure onion skinning. It's called that way because like the uh, translucent layers of the inside of an onion, this feature allows you to preview how the animation was before the current frame in time and to get some kind of ghosting effect if you want. So allow me to turn it on. I'm going to enable it and you will see that red overlay on the character. This is showing the state of the character, the animation, one frame before, or one time step should I say, before where the time cursor is at the moment. As I move forward, you can see how it always corresponds to the previous time step, not the previous keyframe. Be careful, it doesn't have anything to do with the keyframes, which is something that I don't especially like, but that's how it is because Godot does not have master keyframes in the dope sheet. You can set it to show previous time steps or 
future time steps as well. In the future, the next time step in the timeline will show in green, the previous one will show in red. Right now, they overlay on top of the character, but there is a setting to show only the differences so that you can still see your character quite well and you will only see the evolution in the background. This might make it a little easier to see your character in the animation. Note that onion skins are most useful when your character is moving across the screen to see the arcs of motion of your character. I'm going to show you that in a second. But for now, just want to mention that we can go multiple time steps in the past and in the future, so up to three. Which is going to overlay more frames on the character. And then this works with the time step that you define at the bottom, your animation snap. This is the part I don't really like, but you can increase that value to change the onion skinning. You can see every time I change the value, how it updates. If you have a time step of 0.2, for example, 0.2 seconds, it's going to jump to 0.2 seconds forward with every frame that it renders. This is going to be most useful if we have a track that moves the character around the screen. I'm going to do that. I'm going to use my pivot node in this example and create a keyframe where I move the character across the screen. And there you can see how the onion skin gives me a nice preview of the character's line of motion. If I update the easing for my character, this is going to update in real time. Unfortunately, the current frame, the current position of the character right now, it does not update, but the onion skins update instantly. You have to click on the animation to see the update. So you can see the acceleration and deceleration of the character and if you are going to create an arc of motion, this is really useful as if you are doing a jump animation, for example, you will see the character go up and down and you can see, for example, right now the motion is quite triangular, which is not so nice, which is not what I want. So I can then try to play a little bit on the easing or add a few keyframes to try and make the character move a little more fluidly. This is going to be especially useful when you start working with Bezier curve tracks where you can animate the X and Y positions or the various components of a vector individually. That's already quite a lot for this introduction. So I'm going to leave it there and we will do some more animation in other tutorials. See you there.